Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have James Courier with us. James, thanks so much for being on the program. You bet. Thanks for having me, Bronson. Yeah, I'm uh, truly excited about this interview. Um, looking over, you know, what you've been a part of in the past, uh, it's going to be quite a treat to dig into some of the things you've been involved with. So let's just kind of jump into one of your big wins. All right. Um, you might be the perfect guest to have on the show because one of your first startups, Tickle, um, tell me if I'm wrong, was one of the earliest examples of viral growth on the internet. Uh, you were so good at viral growth that I believe you sold it for around $100 million, um, if what the interwebs tell me is true. Um, so first of all, are those things true? I mean, was it one of the earliest examples of viral growth and did it get sold for close to $100 million? Yeah, all that's true. All that's true. I think um, companies like Blue Mountain Arts uh, was probably the, the the site that came before us. Mm -hmm. but we were among the first viral sites, uh, along with a company called eCrush, mm -hmm. which is a little more aggressive in, in how they were growing virally. But uh, yeah, and then we ended up selling to Monster in two thousand and four, uh, and we hit our earnout for three straight years. So it was a little over the number you mentioned, but yeah, yeah, that's about right. Well, that's good. I'm glad I was under instead of over. Um, so tell us, just real briefly, what was Tickle, but more importantly, way back in the day, because I believe you started in 99, sold it in 2004, you said, um, how did it go viral, and what did you learn about viral growth kind of during that process from 99 to 2004? Sure, sure. So Tickle was a self-assessment uh, testing site, so think of quizzes, mm -hmm. and uh, that was an idea. We, we knew that user-generated content was going to be big. Um, we didn't think that it was going to be movies and radio and magazines, which was what Spinner and Broadcast.com and iVillage were all doing back then. We thought that every new technology explodes its own type of content. Like TV didn't really become TV until 1981 when MTV came out, for instance. But every new technology develops its own media form. We knew that <clears throat> user-generated content, although that's not what we called it. We actually called it Me Media back uh -huh. then, but that was going to be big. And we were looking for forms that, that showed us that. And Blue Mountain Arts was this greeting card site where you could create your own greeting cards and send it to each other. Okay. And that, that triggered my thinking. And then I saw people take a, a quiz offline on paper, and they were so engaged in it and they were so excited that I realized it would be a perfect form of user-generated content. In fact, you could guide them by answering these questions and generate all sorts of different results that yeah. they could then share with their friends and they could share and compare. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's what people like to do. So that's what Tickle was, and um, you know the problem with testing and quizzes is that it's not a generally sticky thing. You don't take a test and the next day take a test and take. If you have an email mm -hmm. account like Hotmail, use it again and again. Okay. Um, use it every day because that's where you're getting your email. But with testing, you don't need to go back every day. So we necessarily had to get viral over and over and over again. When we first got viral, it's what we called entertainment virality, mm -hmm. where people just said, dude, you got to look at this. Mm -hmm. This is hilarious, right? Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, they talk about viral videos on YouTube and other things. That's typically cases of, of entertainment virality. Mm -hmm. And that's very helpful. And, you know, within eight days of us launching our, our viral tests, our, our exciting tests on the site, mm -hmm. you know, getting a million hits a day, um, because people were literally just telling each other about it by word of mouth. The press was reporting on it, and people were sending it to each other in emails. And those were the three ways of getting viral back in those days. Yeah. Uh, really only those three ways. And, uh, and then over time, as the excitement about the test and the quizzes diminished, where we were only maybe bringing on forty or 50,000 new people a day, uh -huh. um, you know, we then had to figure out how to make it more mechanical, okay. where actually direct people in the product to send it and share it and compare with their friends. Yeah. And then we created these boards where by sending it to your friends when they came back, you would get to see their scores and you would be notified by email that so and so has now taken the test, find out what dog type she is or find out who her celebrity match is, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so that was sort of the second phase. Once the initial entertainment virality diminished, we then started learning how to do directed virality. Um, along with that, we started, this is 2000 now, to mm -hmm. early 2001, we got into building you know, A, B, C, D, E testing type mm -hmm. harnesses on the site. So we started looking at the various versions. And I think we were one of the earliest companies to do that along with probably eBay and Amazon. Yeah. But from the media side, without a really you know, non-advertising based model, we were probably one of the first companies to do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned kind of two phases to your virality. You had the entertainment phase, and then you kind of had the more planned mechanism phase, like we're going to build it into the product. Would you advise startups to even try the first phase, or is entertainment just luck? You just happen to have something like Gangnam Style. Nobody thought it would have that many views, and it does. Can you actually plan for entertainment virality, or should startups just jump to the second one and ignore kind of your success in the first part? Two comments on that. There are people who believe they can architect viral videos, and they have whole websites about this, mm -hmm. saying if it's including you know, babies or kittens or politics, mm -hmm. and if you put it at this section of the video and then you do this, mm -hmm. they've seen themselves get repeatedly viral. Mm -hmm. I've never tried it. They claim they can do it. Uh -huh. um, it seems hard to me. Yeah. Uh, Number one, number two, but but I don't wouldn't discount the fact that some people could do it. Sure. Um, number two, if you're going to get entertainment virality, what you want to do is build a platform where lots of things can be tried mm -hmm. at no cost to you, so that you can then get lucky. You want to be YouTube, not the video. Correct. <laughs> there you go. You want to be the person you know getting the user generated content, which is what you did with Tickle. Um, you weren't just a single quiz; you were a platform for all kinds of quizzes and different sorts of entertainment value. Um, right. From the time from Tickle until now, so you sold it 2004, you know, here we are nine years later. Has virality changed or is it really the exact same thing, just new players? How do you see it as one of the kind of the early people to figure it out? So what's interesting is that the themes that were viral in the past seem to be getting viral again in the future. Mm -hmm. So things like eCrush, you know, and, and, and quizzes or mm -hmm. things that were viral in the past continue to be viral. I, I think photos is a good example, mm -hmm. right? Um, as soon as Friendster came out and was really the first site that was leveraging the growth of digital photography, they got viral. And then we launched a photo sharing site called Ringo where we grew to 47 million people in six months virally. And then we added the feed. And then 18 months later, Facebook added a feed. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, you know, Instagram comes along just last year and boom, gets viral on photos. So things haven't changed in the sense that we all like the same things we always liked. Yeah. But the mechanics of it have certainly changed. As I said, there were three ways of getting viral before. Mm -hmm. Now you've got Android and iOS and you've got Craigslist and Pinterest and you know, so many different places you've got to go to find your, your spread, your viral spread. It's yeah. it's much more complicated environment. Yeah, you could almost say that the psychology has remained, but the channels have, you know, become greater. Um, and, and I noticed with everything you say, you talk about it from the user's point of view. People like quizzes. People like photos. Um, and we'll get to that towards the end of the interview because I think that that's maybe a theme in your career is, a, a deeper understanding of psychology than most product guys, but we'll come back to that. Um, so after Tickle, you started Ooga Labs, and tell me if I'm wrong, it seems like it's a greenhouse slash incubator for startups. Um, is it really for startups, or is it just for your own ideas? What, what are you actually incubating there? <laughs> yeah, it, for the first few years, it was just for our own ideas. Uh -huh. um, we had a lot of ideas around things that we could do to help the world, like in medicine or education or family connections, charity. We were we were trying to use our technology. We felt very fortunate to have what happened to us at Tickle happen mm -hmm. and felt like we could use the internet for good. Yeah. And um, so we, we had a bunch of ideas that, that we worked on, um, some of which didn't work but ended up becoming other businesses, um, some of which worked really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up with a, a social gaming company that came out of there. We came, we came out with a uh, marketplace and a network around uh, medical apps Mm -hmm. that's uh, doing quite well now. Um, and then, of course, Iron Pearl came out of it, um, yeah. which we might talk about later. But So we had three good companies in four years, which is not the best track record, but it's, but it's pretty good. I'd and, say it's um, pretty good given the, the death rate. <laughs> and we were just trying to um, you know, use, apply these marketplace and network principles. Um, and, and remember, growth isn't just viral. Mm -hmm. Viral is sort of free growth. But... The other half of growth is buying traffic mm -hmm. and learning how to do that. So for Tickle, you know, we got to 30 million users before we spent a dime of marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. and then we started buying more and more. And by the end, we were spending perhaps $2 million a month buying traffic. Wow. And the same thing happened with Wonder Hill, our gaming company, where we got the first sort of 13 or 15 million users virally. But once we found a hit game where we could actually 
mon- you know, monetize the users enough to pay for traffic than we did. Yeah. And that company, we ended up spending as much as $6 million a month buying traffic to it. So it's both viral and, and buying and, and combining them often yeah. does very well. That's really good to hear from you because sometimes we think, you know, we have to be a purist. It's either purely viral or it's not real growth. It's not really exciting. So it's great to hear that you, you know, start with virality and you understand that deeply, but then you're not afraid to go and spend millions a month on ad buys because growth is growth. And as long as you got something that's working, it's working. It doesn't have to be just viral to be growth. So thanks for kind of sharing that insight. Um, with Ooga Labs, you say that you focus on networks and marketplaces. Do you feel like networks and marketplaces are just more susceptible to growth is that kind of why you're drawn to them? Because you feel like if you can get something to work, it can spread through a network and through a marketplace. Well, why are you drawn to those? Yeah. So the first few years of Google, we were doing our own ideas, and those are networks and marketplaces, except for the gaming company, which, is, again, is a perishable thing. Mm-hmm. But the last year, we've just been spending time with companies that weren't our, our, weren't our ideas and helping them with growth and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, we are focused on marketplaces and networks because those are the winner-takes-all markets. So if you're you're a social network and you're MySpace and you're Friendster or you're High Five or you're Mm -hmm. something else, you all lost. You all lost to the one that takes it all. Mm -hmm. Or if you're um, some sort of a a marketplace for collectibles or for cars, eBay won, right? Mm -hmm. Like these things tend to be winner-takes-all markets. So Whoever grows fastest and get those network gets those network effects, mm-hmm. those are the companies that not only become multi billion dollar valued companies, mm-hmm. but they also end up forcing everybody else out of the space. So if you're not that guy, mm-hmm. you might as well not play the game. So when we go in to help a company figure out their growth strategy, they know that there's six other or eight other or twelve other guys, mm-hmm. and one of them's gonna be the winner mm-hmm. and the rest of them will become irrelevant. Yeah. So their willingness to actually do what we suggest to do is extremely high <laughs> because they know that's the game. Yeah. And we know that that's the game. So their, our value to them is extremely high mm-hmm. and, and their valuations get extremely high. So it, it's just more remunerative to us. Yeah. It's more fulfilling you know, when, yeah. you take, when you take a market. Yeah, it seems like you're going for a grand slam with the kinds of ideas that you go for. You're not looking for singles and doubles. Um, it seems like the risk of failure is higher, though, with grand slams. Is that fair to say? Because Absolutely. it's a winner-take-all, and you know there's no second or third place to pull out a single or double, you just become high-five, like you're, you're gone eventually. Um, and you're okay with that risk. It, it's, it's worth it to you to go for the grand slam. Absolutely. That's, that's the only way you change the world. That's the only way you really change things. Yeah. It seems like you're willing to go for it. I read your letter on the Uga Labs uh, front page. Um, it's kind of your letter to all your colleagues uh, languishing and you know in their cubicles. Um, I would recommend everybody go to is it ugalabs.com? Is that where to find it? Um, go and read that because you'll get an insight um, into your mind through that little letter, that little memo that you sent out. That you really do go for it. Um, and I think to get true viral growth or even to buy growth. You have to have that kind of mentality. Am I wrong? You have to be the guy that's willing to play a game where only one person can win to have awesome growth. That's right. And I think that, you know, this mentality about growth is really the important thing. I think you had mentioned before we started that, you know, you want to get down to the real growth stuff. But mm-hmm. it's funny because around growth, it's largely your mentality. It's, yeah. uh, it's, a little, it's a little squishy, you know. And if you go to Stanford Business School, the mm-hmm. – the most uh, the course that everybody loves is called Touchy Feely, <laughs> and, uh, and at Harvard Business School, the course that everybody loves is called Lead because it's all about psychology. Mm-hmm. And it was in that Lead course that I first took uh, the Myers Briggs test, which led me to the idea for Tickle. Yeah, because it is it is about human psychology. It's about all of our psychologies. Yeah, absolutely. So, what do you know about psychology that everybody else doesn't? That allows you to compete in markets where there's only one winner. And then to actually be the winner more than not, like what is it about your own psychology that allows you to break through where other people just can't or don't or won't? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that we aren't always the winners in our markets. You're being you're being much too generous. We we lose a lot. Um, I guess I don't see the losers because TechCrunch doesn't write about them as much. So I just see I, I see the wins. I guess that's right. No, you got to lose a lot. Mm-hmm. You got to lose a lot. And and I mean I think that. Um, I don't know anything more than anybody else knows. Mm-hmm. It's just um, I was just one of the early people to realize it was really important. Yeah. And um, you know the the psychology I have of sort of sustaining days and weeks and months and even years of failure mm-hmm. to try to get to that 
thing that works. That's the hardest part about it uh-huh. from an internal psychological perspective because you do have to fail so much mm-hmm. and you have to take your team with you. And so you come up with another idea and they try it and they work their guts mm-hmm. out for two to three weeks and then you try it and it doesn't work again mm-hmm. and again and again. That's the hardest part uh, is keeping the faith and keeping moving forward. Yeah. But in terms of um, human psychology, I just think that you have to notice you know, what other people really like Mm-hmm. as opposed to what you might like. Okay. Um, you have to spend time just noticing when you go to the when you go to the gym, which are the pages of the magazine which are most wrinkled with sweat? Because uh-huh. that's the ones people spent the most time on. Uh-huh. You go to the supermarket, what's there? All right? When you mm-hmm. when you look at the companies that have a lot of traffic, what why? You know, mm-hmm. what is it what is it there in the language uh, that makes sense to people? Now psychology lives a lot in our emotions, but those emotions are often triggered by language. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be a real student of language. If, mm-hmm. I had a, if I had a blog that wasn't the Ugo Labs blog, if I just had a James Courier blog, it would be called Finding the Language, because that's at the core of all these things, yeah. I think. No, it's very insightful. Um, one follow-up question. You talked about being able to go from failure to failure and still go again for the success after spending a few weeks on something. Is that process easier or harder um, after you've had one big win, right? So you sell tickle, you have a big win. Does it actually get harder because now you're supposed to win, or is it easier because now you have you know a bankroll to try a bunch more things? How does the psychology within you change after having one big win? Is it easier or harder to keep trying? Um, it's a good question. I think it's harder because you don't need to anymore. Uh, and the first one, your back's against the wall. Mm-hmm. You have no choice. You got the it's, fight in you. It's do or die. Yeah. And after you've had a success, sometimes you're like, boy, this is a pain in my ass. Why am I doing this? So why do you do it? <laughs> um, because if you're not growing, you're dead. Yeah. It, you know, like a plant grows until it dies, and then it dies. It's there just the go. natural cycle of life. There you go. That's right. So uh, sun, okay. a sun, sun grows until it explodes, and then, you know, it's done. And then we have, you know, a, a cold death. <laughs> That's right. So uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier that Uga Labs incubated was Wonder Hill. Um, and you sold Wonder Hill, and it produced Dragons of Atlantis, and it had quite a bit of growth. I don't know the exact numbers, um, but I mean, right now it has over a million likes on its Facebook page, so I can only imagine how many people are actually playing the game. Um, yeah. So I think it's fair to say it went viral in its own way. I don't know how it compares to Tickle if it does, but it, it had a, a tremendous growth. Was its growth different than Tickle? Was it a totally different growth mechanism with totally different things you had to learn or was it kind of the same thing? You looked at psychology, you found out what pages are wrinkled, and you put it into play with your product. I mean, was it a totally new learning experience, or was it the same thing as Tickle? Um, it was similar to Tickle in the sense that Tickle, we built a platform and then developed quizzes, and it wasn't until quiz number 28 that we got viral. Okay. So we had 27 failures. Okay. And 43 venture firms that I talked to who all said no. Uh-huh. And then as soon as that one went viral, four said yes. Yeah. Wonder Hill was the same thing. We built a game, and then we built out a platform for building games. Mm-hmm. We built six more games that were all failures. Uh-huh. And then Dragons of Atlantis was game number eight, and it worked. Yeah. Um, so it was similar in that respect. It was different in the sense that when we built Dragons of Atlantis, we knew we were trying to build a game that you could buy traffic to. Okay. So there was Farmville and... And that sort of thing. That was very viral with all the mechanics that Zynga was doing. And they were making about four cents per day per player. Okay. But that doesn't really give you enough lifetime value to buy traffic. Yeah. So you need to find a lifetime value that's going to be giving you 20 cents a day per user mm-hmm. um, for a long period of time. So we knew we were trying to build a game like that. And, uh, and so we did. Yep. And uh, we researched what types of environments people like to play these games in. We... Um, tested out lots of different names and conceits, as we call them. So in L.A., they call movies, what's the conceit of your movie? Okay. So we, okay. Use, this, we use the same word when talking about our products and our, and our businesses. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, what's the conceit? Mm-hmm. And uh, the conceit of it was you're in this fantastical place mm-hmm. uh, of Atlantis. And um, is the conceit Amazons? Is it realms? Is it wars? Is it floods? Is it... Dragons, what is it? Mm-hmm. And we decided on Dragons of Atlantis as being sort of the, the most enticing thing that people were looking at. Yeah. 
we built the game around that that idea. Yeah. Um, and then we, you know, started buying traffic in slowly, fifty dollars a day, hundred dollars a day, three hundred dollars a day, and then it started ramping, and then it was four thousand dollars a day, and and off it went. Uh huh. Until um, so it was sort of hundred thousand dollars a day, two hundred thousand dollars a day. We were just buying all this traffic. Once, <laughs> uh -huh. once you buy all the people in, then they all start talking about it. So you get actually a little lift in the word of mouth. I got gotcha. you on top of it. Yeah. So I was really it was, it was. Whereas Tickle grew virally for a long period until we figured out how to monetize it. Uh huh. Uh, as opposed to we knew how to monetize Dragon's Landis, we just had to figure out how to get people in there to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, do you know anything about video games before creating this one? I'm just curious now. No, you that's, nothing. The sen that's the sense I get. That's why I'm wondering. See, I thought you were a gamer and you, you know, this was a passion. It no. seems like you just A/B tested yourself into, you know, a game that could grow. Is that is that accurate? A little bit, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, we we knew nothing about it when we when we started Wonder Hill. The first yeah. game was a fluke. The first game just worked out and gave us a revenue stream to say, okay, we'll go into the gaming business. Yeah. And then the next six were all failing because we knew nothing about it. But in the end, we actually um, sort of got rid of all the gaming people mm -hmm. involved with the product and just did it ourselves and said, you know, what would we do if, if we wanted to make this business successful <laughs> as opposed to we just love making games because yeah. the games, they, just, they live to make games that reflect their inner soul. That's, and that's yeah. just make for a good business. That's yeah. so interesting because it's hard to not do it that way it's hard to not create a company that represents your inner soul. It feels like we're destined to do that and we're supposed to do that. And here you are almost like casually and coldly and calmly stepping back and saying, no, it's not my innermost passion, but I know how to make money with it. And it seems diametrically opposed to the way so many companies are made. Um, I think that's maybe the takeaway from this whole thing so far. Well, but, but that is an interesting takeaway. But remember, I only got to that point after about two years, mm -hmm. year and a half of failure, 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 mm -hmm. when I had raised money mm -hmm. on the company from investors who I trust and admire, and I didn't want to lose the money. Uh -huh. but we had 30 employees, and I didn't want them to have a failure. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, we started a different type of a company that I had a lot of passion for. Uh -huh. It was in my inner soul. Okay. But then this game just was a fluke. All right. And, and so we kind of had to follow it because it was working. I got gotcha. you. So, so when I start companies, I do start companies that are a reflection of my inner soul. Uh -huh. It's just that sometimes, most of the times, reflections of your inner soul don't make good businesses. Uh -huh. And then when you get far enough down in your bank account, you got to get real. <laughs> You'll go with and the fluke that's working, yeah. Yeah, you get a little cold and analytical, and then you just yeah. you go after the money so that you can have a successful business and then do it again. Yeah. No, and I the think, same that's with Tickle. I mean, Tickle was supposed to be a self-improvement type of a thing. Mm -hmm. Learn about yourself, find mm -hmm. a better job, find a better mate, you know, talk to your mother and dad better. Like we wanted to change the world and improve the world. Uh -huh. And, you know, it was largely sort of a money-making venture. Yeah. But that's kind of what ends up happening a lot is yeah. that what you wish people wanted is not what they want. Yeah. And, and then you can always do things later in life that are purely not-for-profit where you can really just give and do without the expectation of return. You know, if early on you follow the, the flukes that happen to be monetizable. So, yeah, I get it. Um, let, let's transition a little bit into Iron Pearl. And to be honest, this is what I'm most excited about because I don't know anything about it. I see a landing page and I'm incredibly intrigued by it just because of who you are and your past. So I want to know more about Iron Pearl because it seems like from the little bit I can glean from it, that this is kind of like your magnum opus. This is like all roads lead to Rome, all roads for you kind of lead to Iron Pearl. And maybe that's overstating it, maybe that's inaccurate. Um, but you tell me, what is Iron Pearl? So I may end up disappointing you because... <laughs> that's quite all right. It won't be there, the first time. Yeah, there's not... Uh, you know, basically Iron Pearl is the accumulation of what we've learned about growth over the years. Mm -hmm. And growth, people think it's about getting new users, and it is. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, there's a more refined way of looking at it, which starts with retained users mm -hmm. and monetized users. Mm -hmm. So what you want is to bend the monetized curve up and to the right. Okay. 
And the one that's above that is the retained curve. They might be retained, but they're not monetized. And the one above that is not retained, but just new. Mm -hmm. So you've got these three curves, and you've got to develop the products and the tactics and the language mm -hmm. in a way that bends the bottom one. Yeah, the revenue one. The revenue one. Yeah. And there's software tools you can use that we've developed over the last years. Mm -hmm. There's language techniques, there's market approach techniques, mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's just a huge toolkit mm -hmm. of things one should be doing to maximize your chance of winning in a space that is generally opaque to everyone, but having done this now for 15 years mm -hmm. um, and put in my 10,000 hours and uh -huh. Stan, business partner, having put in his 10,000 hours, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we know what the toolkit are. We know which tools to grab to help out with a particular company. So mm -hmm. Iron Pearl is our way of of focusing in on helping people in a more systematic way mm -hmm. do this sort of thing. Um, and generally, we're working with um, companies that are already pretty hot, mm -hmm. that have already gotten pretty far, and we're trying to take them from <clears throat> something that's working to the number one in the space and taking out everybody else. Yeah. So do you come in as a kind of a two-man consulting team? You mentioned Stan. Do you guys come in and, you know, take share in a company or take an insane amount of money and just say, now we're going to show you, kind of open the kimono, here's what works, here's what doesn't? Is that yeah. really what Iron Pearl is into the day? Yes. Yeah. So you're a ninjas yeah. for hire. <laughs> and it's all suite of software that, mm -hmm. that, you know, having built so many of these viral platforms, it's a suite of software that combines different pieces that haven't been combined before. So are you guys going to allow other people to access that software, or is it only just a few companies when they come to you that really get access to that, that software you're talking about? Um, is it going to be a decided, consumer product? We haven't decided yet. Okay. We haven't decided. Yeah. But it's, it, right now it's working well where we're just focusing on a small number of companies because it is so much of a mindset. You can't just give someone a tool and have them fly it properly. Absolutely. It's... Um, the way the software is built, it's obvious what to do mm -hmm. if you know what to do. I hear you. The problem is getting to even understand why you should be doing something is the problem, and that takes time. And you can't just convince the CEO of that. You've got to explain that to the VP of engineering and the VP of marketing and then all the people that work for them. So it's got to be a cultural thing. Yeah. So we don't know that there's a real business in just distributing the software like a Kiss Metrics or something. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. If you were to distribute... We don't, we don't take any money. It's all, it's all equity. That yeah. We get compensated in equity. Which is work. smart because, I mean, if it's really going to work, then your equity is going to be extremely valuable if you believe in your product. So that's great. Um, right. Is part of the fear of releasing it as a product that by releasing it to something that anyone can access, that you actually kill what makes it work? That when everyone starts doing these things... Let, you know, most of them won't understand it enough, but so these yeah. are things that are deeper than just once everyone starts doing them, it breaks. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that's that's not a worry. Okay. It's, uh, there's now so many platforms to buy on, so many platforms to get viral on. Mm -hmm. Those platforms are each changing at a rapid pace. It's changing all the time so fast that there's very few collisions. I, I mean, gotcha. Every month we just weep for all the opportunities that no one grabbed. Yeah. You know, like no yeah. company grabbed that opportunity on the on the Android platform that's now closed because yeah. of the, they changed in their new release. I got gotcha. you. Know, it, it, it's just the, the possibilities for growth are sitting everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of grabbing them, being in the right place at the right time. See, that's so, what, yeah, we're not we're not worried about competition in that way. It's it's so big and it's moving so fast. Yeah, I, I love hearing that perspective because when you're new to this, it feels like a zero sum game. There's someone else who's already got the traffic. There's someone else who's already did this. But when you see it as I'm on the bleeding edge, there's always a new opportunity. And some people, some opportunities will be taken by nobody. There's so many of them. It gives you a different mindset. It allows you to really think, like, I can win this game. I can grow. There, there's more opportunities, you know, than I have time to, to worry about. So that's great. Um, you mentioned on the homepage of Iron Pearl that it's growth 2.0. Um, I was intrigued by that because I'd never heard it before. But what is growth 2.0 and what was growth 1.0 in your mind? Growth 1.0 is just looking at new users. Mm -hmm. Growth 2.0 is looking at monetized users. I got you. Makes total sense. Um, let's come back to the psychology part again real quick, and then I'm going to have you give back to the community for a moment. 
Um, on the homepage of Iron Pearl, it says you're hiring. So if people are listening to this, um, you know, go check it out. Um, obviously, after this interview, you'll probably be interested in working with James. Um, you say that they need a deep interest in psychology. Does that go all the way down in the company, or is it just for the CEO and the CMO and the CTO? Does everyone really need this psychological bent to the way they view the world to, to make something grow the way it needs to? I think so. I think so. I think the difference between, you know, why is it that so few companies are good at growth? Mm -hmm. it's, it's because they don't have the whole mentality mm -hmm. throughout the stack of the company that, you know, what, what the language is is important. Mm -hmm. And testing and retesting and letting yourself be surprised, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And um, if you really understand psychology, I think you get a sense that there's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, especially in the engineering trade, are like, this is right mm -hmm. and it works, this is wrong and it doesn't work. It's binary. It's binary, and I don't, I don't think that's true with this. So having people on the team that um, enjoy exploring mm -hmm. the, the, the A-B testing and the A-B-C-D-E-F testing, and mm -hmm. that's just really important to the DNA of the company so that you can move through all the failures and the months of failure mm -hmm. until you find the thing that finally works. Yeah, that's great. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so now give back a little bit. You, you've, you've had, like you said, 15 years of learning and growing and doing and failing and succeeding and all those things. Um, what would you say right now is the best training ground for someone who wants to understand startup growth? They've never experienced it. They've never been up close and personal next to somebody growing something successfully. What do they do to get in this game? Is it something they read? Is it somewhere they go? Is it something they build? What would you recommend someone does just to learn the beginnings about startup growth? I think there's some great bloggers out there like Andrew Chen mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and others who are now blogging a lot about this. Yeah. Uh, and I think just by reading their stuff, you can get a good basis for the discussion. Yeah. And it's, um, then it's a matter of joining a startup and uh, just hacking away at it and you know, trying and failing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there were some guys in Washington, D.C. who figured out how to get really viral, and they ended up building Living Social, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Top 5. They had this, some sort of Top 5 app that they tried, and it was like their 20th attempt, yeah. and off it went, you know. And they were able to hack into the whole viral channels inside of Facebook by themselves yeah. in D.C., which is hard to do because a lot of the viral stuff and a lot of the growth stuff that happens around here in Silicon Valley we all learn from each other through lunches and dinners and parties and being friends with each other. Yeah. Um, so, but it can be done. So yeah. I think just getting out there, reading all the stuff, you know, spending 72 hours, spending a week and a half, just reading and reading, collating stuff, putting it in a Word document so you feel like you're kind of studying it and looking mm -hmm. at the language people are using, mm -hmm. looking at the history of it, you know, getting to recognize some of the names of the people who actually have done it well over the years. Yeah. Then, and then just practicing. Yeah, that's great advice. And I like the way you make it something you really study. When you say put it in a Word document, it goes beyond casual blog reading when I'm laying down to go to bed. Now it's, this is something to learn. Like dive in deep and don't come up for air until you figured something out. Um, so, so I like that mentality because you need that mentality. Uh, let me ask you one last question, then we'll close out because it's been an incredible interview and I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, what are the biggest growth dead ends that you see companies make? I know you invest in companies, you start companies. What are the, just the growth dead ends that if you could just warn us all about right now and save us a year of our life, uh, we'll be better off for it? What should we not be doing to grow? Um, you shouldn't be spending money when the lifetime value doesn't support it mm -hmm. in order to impress VCs to invest in your company. Trying to get the ramp up right before the meeting because <laughs> it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable, and it teaches your whole team that this is the kind of thing you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And then they lose faith, and if you lose faith, then you've lost it because this is an iteration game. Yeah. Um, that's one thing that people do. Um, what's another thing they do? Um, being too aggressive with your users. I mm -hmm. think you know, 10 years ago you could get away with that, mm -hmm. but that was a long time ago. I think um, you have to be smooth with the users, not aggressive. Yeah. You know, you have to change the language so that it doesn't feel threatening. There you go, language again, yeah. Right. Uh, but you can't, 
you can't just be overly aggressive in the UX. So the U, mm -hmm. the UI needs to be smooth, mm -hmm. but the UX needs to be gentle. Okay, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So don't don't go off and just start slamming people because it, it it will end it will end badly. Yeah, that's great advice, and we can end right there, James. This has been an incredible interview. Um, it, you know, people are going to watch this and rewatch this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Bronson. And if anybody wants to find more about James, the links will be persistent below this video. So click on them and find out what he's doing and uh, maybe apply for one of his job openings. Thanks again, James. See you later. Okay, bye-bye.